Hello and welcome everybody to this session on how to tame my edge devices. My name is Sven Eric Dioszewski and I'm coming to you from Berlin, Germany, working with Bosch IO. So in the next couple of minutes, I want to take you on the insights and our journey that we had when looking into how to manage edge devices and you could also say how to tame those devices. So the first thing when you uh, look into such a problem is maybe come up with a definition what you actually try to solve or what you actually, which domain you're actually looking into. And I know there's a, there's been a couple of debate on what edge computing is actually is and what it isn't. So for the uh, remainder of this talk, I will more or less rely on this architecture shown in the slide. Um, so we have on the one hand side the constraint device that are really small sensor devices measuring your temperature, measuring your light or something like that. Maybe a small robot or something like controlling a valve. Then you have devices controlling these constraint devices and also being kind of the bridge to the internet um, and also allowing you to do some more comput computational intensive tasks. So uh, here the topic of AI comes into play in the future years possibly and also of more flexibility in your software. Then you have the access transport, which you could also consider as an edge, but maybe for all the telco folks in uh, this talk, I have a bad news for you. I will mostly talk about this uh, device edge or in this case, more the on-premise side. So if, you, uh, and so if you want more about these terms, I would also recommend reading into the white paper on state of the edge. And last but not least, and you can see it in the slides, you have also the cloud, like the big cloud with all where data can aggregate it or you have even more computational power. So I guess so far, not so new, but when we look at these uh, kind of architectures and looking at the, all these devices and all the qualifications that we want our developers to enable to create, you might come up with a situation that looks a bit like this. So you have something like a wolf pack of devices, really heterogeneous. You're not really sure how they interact, if they interact, uh, how this works. So basically when you think about edge management, you want to go from a situation like this to this. You still have your really heterogeneous uh, devices, or in this case, uh, dogs, but they still all behave well and kind of have a common interface in, base in which you can interact with them. So how do we get to, to the support or to the situation? So I would say you need to, to um, answer a couple of questions. So the quest first question is, how do I actually manage my connectivity to the edge? So be it the uh, connection between the on-premise devices and the edge devices and the cloud. Next thing is, how do I record the device state? So how do I know which state my device is actually in? without always talking to the device directly. The next thing is, how do I know what my device is actually capable of doing? And what is the data that can uh, deliver to me, but also what is the data that I can send to this device? And last but not least, but this is what's really important is, how do I ma manage the actual firmware on the device? So when we're talking about Edge and also IoT, managing the software state uh, is becoming more and more important. So coming to the first topic, or as I would call it, connectivity to the cloud. So this little fella here is uh, more maybe on a mindful connection to the, to the cloud, but you, of course, in the technical world, you want to be a reliable connection to be sure that your data is coming to the cloud in a more efficient way. So one project that I want to highlight for this is the so-called Eclipse Hono project. So the aim of Eclipse Hono is following. You have a, a number of things flying or lying or moving or whatever, uh, around and they all are really heterogeneous and uh, may speak a couple of different protocols like HTTP, co-op or even a custom protocol. But you all want, want to connect these devices to um, backend solutions. And this is done by Hono by translating between the different protocols into uh, the AMQP 1.0 protocol. So your business solution would then connect to Hono or to the so-called northbound interface of Hono through AMQP 1.0. Um, if, you, if you take a more deeper look into the architecture, which is we will, we will do on the next slide, you notice that Hono is actually a microservice architecture. So that's a good thing in a way that you can replace each of these microservices with your own implementation. And so this way we will go from left to right to get a deeper understanding of that. Because first of all, we have the devices 
that are only connected or only talking to the adapters, the so-called protocol adapters. So this way you have, uh, for instance, an HTTP adapter and you can scale it uh, in any way you want since you just need another instance of this adapter. Uh, this adapter then uh, is strongly coupled with the so-called device registry to um, check that the device is actually um, authenticated and allowed to communicate with the whole messaging system. So this way you make sure that no uh, third parties are inserting any messages in your network, which might be confusing or even lead to, let's say, more crucial outcomes. Um, once the protocol adapter has translated the, uh, your message, in, um, it gets into the AMQP 1.0 messaging network, where it then can be um, retrieved by the business application. So um, to do that, um, we have what I've done here for you is having an uh, instance of Eclipse Solo in the cloud. And what I will do in a minute, I will skip this demo at this point, but you will see why in a second, um, is you need to do the following three, three steps. First thing is you need to create a tenant. So Hono is actually multi-tenant uh, capable. So you can have um, separate your traffic for different tenants. Next thing is you create a device on that tenant. So for each tenant, you can create a number of devices, which is basically just the representation that the device is there. Next thing that you do then is to create credentials that are connected to the device. So each device can use this set of credentials to connect to the Eclipse Hono instance. And um, the interesting part here is um, you can even have multiple credentials. So uh, this way it's possible that a device is actually sending data on behalf of another device by using this creden the credentials of the other device. So this comes really handy if you have more IoT devices connected to your edge. Um, another word about the communication. So what you've really wondered if you're more into protocols is, okay, how do I do all these different protocols? Maybe going back to the uh, initial slide, like uh, HTTP being a request and response protocol or a MQTT where you have to subscribe and um, yeah, way of uh, communication, subscribe and response. Um, so the answer here is that um, it actually um, has its own set of um, ideas how, how communication can look like, separating it into these three types of uh, messaging. So one is the telemetry message and the other one is event messages. Both are only going from the device up into the cloud. So what's the difference here for telemetry, you have a different quality of service typically than for events. So for events, you would use it for critical messages while telemetry is more, hey, I got a new sensor value. And 10 seconds later, hey, I got another sensor value. So in this case, telemetry, it can happen that it might uh, be dropped. So it's, well, it's not so crucial if it gets dropped. That's why more of the difference here. So the quality of service. So Hearing this, you might wonder, okay, but what do I do if I want to communicate to my device, to my edge device? Then you would use the command and response. And this, depending on the protocol, can be a bit more tricky, uh, which I will show that in my demo in a minute. So from Hono, the question is, how do I get a device twin? Um, I was actually trying to find a good picture for a device twin. This is maybe the closest I could get. So because the idea with the device twin uh, is that you not always talk directly to your device, but you actually uh, talk to an instance, for instance, uh, in the cloud that is representing the state of your device. So every time you want to make a request to your device, you only talk to this device twin and not directly to the, to the thing or the, the device, which makes things a bit easier for uh, the whole communication pattern. And now it's not a surprise, there's, there's a project for that. Name is Eclipse Tito. So with Eclipse Tito, you can exactly do this device twin. And as you can already see on this picture here, it uh, has a good interaction or integration with Eclipse Hono. Because what Eclipse Tito is doing is uh, it provides APIs to the devices and APIs uh, to so-called backend applications or mobile or web apps. So but with 
when, when looking at this, you might wonder, okay, hmm, what's the difference with Hono? I mean, I've seen Ori has APIs for the device and APIs for the backend. So what's the difference? One major difference here is that Ditto is actually able to store the state of this, this, the device or the sync. So uh, um, if you look into the architecture, which is depicted on the right-hand side of the slide, you will see there's an instance of MongoDB running and this MongoDB stores your device state. So every time the device is changing its state, can uh, send this to Ditto and Ditto will store it in the database and a uh, mobile web can then come at any point in time and request this information and it does not need to interact directly with the device. That's one benefit. Another benefit obviously is that you have HTTP and WebSocket APIs also directed to the mobile applications. And these um, APIs are also built based on the features and properties and attributes that you assign to the digital twin. So this is more or less generated, generated automatically, which is also not a feature which you will find in Holo. Um, another thing which is really important when you um, consider integrating your IoT or Edge device into a more broader architecture is also who's actually able to retrieve this information. And this is also done uh, within Ditto because here you can define really strict and fine granular policies on who can read and who can write to a specific thing and who can send messages to which thing, um, which is also really important when you have more complex scenarios. So this about Ditto. Let's get into a demo. I mean, everyone loves demos. Let's get into an example. But um, before we do that, let me maybe first introduce to the example that I sort of. So let's say we want to uh, control a more complex heating system for a big office building. Uh, actually, from at multiple locations, we will only model one location, but the example could go beyond multiple locations. And each location has a set of rooms where you uh, want to heat. So what you will do is you set a temperature for the heating and um, you can also send a message to make like really improved heating. Um, so with that, welcome to the terminal here. So what I prepared for you is a number of small Go programs that will interact with our instance of Hono and Ditto. Maybe first, before we do that, let's uh, show what we've done. So there's a Kubernetes cluster getting uh, running. Um, where all these containers are running. So for instance, here we have the device registry from Hono. Um, then we have a couple of Ditto services running in con uh, containers or pods. And we have also the HTTP adapter. And these are basically the containers that we will interact um, throughout the next calls and minutes. So first thing that we have to do is do the cloud init. So what we've done here is we created a tenant in Eclipse Hono with the tenant ID, my company. And the response was, surprise, surprise, we've created a 201 with ID, my company. Next thing is we will register the device. Um, yeah, so the device was a device ID, my company Berlin has been created, seen because of the response status 201. Uh, next thing we have to do is to create the credentials. Um, now we have uh, set an auth ID, in our case Berlin auth. And we have also created a password, which is where, yeah, plain password of device password. So yeah, nothing fancy and also nothing really secure, but uh, you could also Set for instance certificates here as credentials, but for the uh, sake of the demo, uh, can we keep it simple? So next thing is, um, which is this is actually kind of complicated thing, is connecting Eclipse Hono with Eclipse Ditto. So if you remember the slide with the integration, Ditto will connect to the one point AMQP 1.0 endpoint of Eclipse Hono. So we need to configure um, Ditto to actually use this endpoint and also that it knows what to do with the data that is coming from there. So for instance, Ditto has the capability to um, map, map data coming into uh, to, uh, onto other data in case you have different data formats in your system coming from the devices within your backend. So we will do that. So this actually returns the whole configuration. So I won't go into this, but you can see there's a lot of things that you can set. Then the next thing is now we 
uh, move on to configuring Ditto. So what we will do now is set up a policy. So a policy is something that uh, you can reference later and which tells um, who is able to access which kind of information. So in our case, we have the policy which grants a read write on basically everything. And the name of the policy is, you can see it here, is my company, my policy. Um, next thing is you press uh, enter to create the thing. And what we have now here is we created a thing and has the thing ID my company Berlin. So namespace and uh, ID. And you now it's getting interesting. It has the attributes that the location is in Germany. And it has a feature lobby, which is in our case representing one room, uh, which has currently no value because we don't know the temperature there. The same with the offers. And this is also an interesting thing. We have properties where we don't know the value, but we also can set desired properties indicating to the thing that um, we want this to be realized. So in our case, we want to have a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. So sorry for all the American folks, but it's this temperature will be in Celsius since the uh, yeah, location is in Germany or uh, in Europe. So what we've done here is we have now the thing set with a desired property and no actual value. So let's jump to the device. So what, we, what I've created here is a code for the device. So um, then we, once we run it, we'll see it has uh, two options. One is uh, sending telemetry and the other thing is to receive. First, we will see send some telemetry. Uh, so what it's doing now, it sends a telemetry message to Hono. And then from Hono, the message is sent uh, to Ditto and uh, used to update the uh, state of the thing in Ditto. So when I run this, um, yeah, unfortunately it's, <laughs> Information is not the best, but uh, what you can see is it sets the path of the feature, office, properties, value to the value 18. So how do we, how do we check that this actually worked? Um, yeah, guess it, I don't come, uh, this doesn't come unexpected, so I'm prepared. We have a third script, which is, has a name go run cloud go. Uh, again, we have multiple options and one is simply to request the thing information. And so we get our information from the thing. This is pretty similar to what we've got back once when we uh, created the thing. Difference here now is that our office property value is actually 18. So we managed to update this value from our thing. Um, which is, this is pretty nice, but the question is um, what is what happens if I want to do it a bit more, let's say, interactive? So I uh, want to make sure that the device is actually receiving this information by now and not uh, once it uh, checks for the device state. So one thing is that uh, Ditto can send events once uh, any value or property changes. Um, I won't show that here, but what I will show you is you can also send messages, messages directly to the thing. So this way, um, Ditto will take care of delivering that message. And in our special example, actually Ditto is delegating this to Hono. So the question of course is how do we get um, a command um, via HTTP to, to a device, which is um, kind of different because you can push the data. So in, in case of HTTP, we need to do a, um, a get request from the device and then piggyback the response in a way to send the command. So how is this done? Um, we um, have again our device and we will send it in some kind of receive mode by sending setting a header value of Hono TTD to a specific value. And this will indicate to Hono that it can send a command back to the device for the next uh, couple of seconds, which is configured in the header. And this is exactly what we do here. So we send uh, another telemetry message. Uh, now again, this is value 18 and wait now for 60 seconds uh, for a message. So on our cloud, we send the message. And what's happened here, it's happened rather quick. Um, let's go first to the cloud. Um, it sent a message that's saying, okay, let's do a start uh, quick heating. 
And uh, so in our example, it would be that the thing has or the heating system is heating pretty quick for the next five minutes or full speed or full power. And we already got the response back from the thing saying, hey, okay, I got this and I will do that for you. So start quick heating is true. And uh, let's go to the device, what had happened here. Uh, yes, we will send the telemetry message. Then we got the message um, saying, okay, um, please do this. And the, um, through the response. So that's why the response status is 200 and we have uh, our response contained which contains the message. Uh, in this case, you just have to believe me this. Um, it's just kind of hidden in, in the program. So with that, um, I will conclude the demo for now and jump back to the slides. And what we've achieved so far is to deal with the actual data. So we have the whole device flow of doing all the different re requests and responses, moving data around, uh, saving the device state. But sometimes this is not enough because uh, we still don't know which com commands we actually can send to our device. We don't, and we also don't know what kind of data we can expect. So if you go back to our doc, sometimes we don't really, we not really care about the, really the doc sitting in our room. We are more care about what the doc is actually possibly doing and uh, which is also possible to document without having the actual doc or the actual edge thing to go back to our edge analogy. And this is something that uh, where you need mo uh, modeling for this. So when people don't have a doc at, at hand, they start to paint one. And when people don't have the edge, actual edge device to work with, they start to model the capabilities. I mean, this is really, Bad analogy, but maybe stick to me with, with me. I guess you know or get the point what I'm driving at. Because for modeling, that's what I want to talk about in the next minutes. Um, there's actually two approaches that I want to show you. One is the Eclipse Water Project. And you guess by the name Eclipse again, uh, that is, uh, is developed not so far away in a sense from Eclipse Ditto. So there's some uh, loosely coupled integration going on. And with Ditto, you can exactly um, model the, the capabilities of your IoT device. This is where it started. And then integrated with uh, different things uh, or different cloud services or different services or generate stub code that's, for instance, in Java to interact with Sono or in uh, with Arduino. And what you do here is you say, okay, I have this uh, kind of sensor values and then in your stub code, you only need to integrate how to read the actual sensor. So the actual hardware driver in a sense. Cool. The cool thing about Vorto, it had a repository where you could uh, store all these different models so you could really uh, easily reuse it and reference it. Uh, recently, this has been moved to GitHub, so there's some tight change there, but uh, the models are still available. And what is really important to note here is you still model the capabilities and data from a single device. So it's really device-centric and the whole modeling approach is coming from the device or device-centric modeling approach. Kind of a new kid on the block is the so-called BAM meta model. Uh, it has been published as part of the open manufacturing platform, which is also kind of a new um, activity going on in the manufacturing domain to um, align some activities and also do some open source um, work together there. And one of the first results there is this BAM meta model. So here, Again, we are able to model the data and the uh, capabilities of our devices, but we are not coming from the device side, but we are more um, coming from a modeling of so-called digital twins. Um, I haven't said the word digital twin so far for a simple reason, because there's so many definitions out there, at least the ones I heard, and it really depends on the domain you're in and who you're asking. So that's, that's kind of a difficult topic, but, the way we would uh, model or define digital twins here is that we have a, a digital representation of a physical asset. So a thing, a machine, for instance. And the interesting thing of, for this asset is it may have different aspects. So coming back to our uh, heating example, we have maybe the aspect of the current mode of operation. So which, uh, which temperature is in the room, which, um, 
um, like how quick are we um, heating? What kind of energy are we using? Are we um, using intensity one, two, three, four, five? I'm not a heating expert. Or, but there's also another aspect that you might be interested in, this, which is yeah, who manufactured this heating system? Who uh, was actually the one uh, putting it uh, in, in place? Who is um, responsible for the maintenance? So these are two completely different aspects of the same aspect. So a digital twin uh, most likely would also represent both aspects. And to keep it short, the, what BAN is doing, it just it allows you to model each of these aspects. So uh, what does this mean? It uh, defines uh, with an LDF a set of um, yeah, elements which you can use for your model to use to have your own model based on this meta model. And how does this look like in practice? Uh, yeah, to have a more practical, yeah, it's not really practical, to have a more an example. We have on the one hand side the real abstraction of the meta model. Based on the meta model, you can do your mo model. So now in this example, we model the aspect of movement. So a thing that can move around, it's an EGV, a robot, a car, bicycle, human, everyone can move. And this can be modeled in a way, okay, we have, it is moving as a boolean value and the position in 3D space. So the actual implementation, and this is where it would, for instance, come to the level of digital, is um, the JSON that we get out of here. So we have a JSON is moving with a boolean value and the position X, Y, Z um, presenting, representing the position in the 3D space. So um, what our digital twin then would look like, uh, could say, okay, we have a uh, digital twin, which has this, the following aspects. The aspect models are lying somewhere here. And go to this uh, address to get the actual data. And this is where also we have um, then the model modeled based on the BAM aspect meta model. And maybe another cool thing that you can mention here is um, that it actually allows you to move your domain knowledge out of the uh, application into the model. So uh, in, not, what you often do is you, for instance, if you um, implement an UI for the data coming out of your edge or your edge devices, you, you know from your domain expertise, okay, this data is somewhere between zero and 25 and it's you know, something in degree Celsius and it is uh, representing my room. Uh, this is because I just told you on the, uh, in our slides, because I'm the domain of expert of our special heating system. But this way, when we model this with BAM, we, uh, uh, software is able to execute or to extract this information and already build this UI based on this information. So let's have, a, for instance, having a y-axis, which has only values up to 25 and labeling the axis. Maybe so much about data modeling, and I really have to admit this is more, more like an uh, excourse when talking about um, edge devices or more uh, really separate topic, but I think it all aligns together once we want to bring our edge uh, or our edge management into a broader perspective uh, of moving and managing the data coming out of, out of there. So let's go back to our edge device, so the actual device level. One thing, what happens if our devices come out? I wouldn't say broken because it doesn't really fit the picture, but has some issues, put it this way, and I can just lie around or maybe have some security issues, which of course is not so easy to depict in a dark picture. Um, how do we deal with that? And um, one thing is the firmware on the device. This is the one thing. And the other thing is how do we manage that? And this is where Eclipse Hawk comes into play, which is actually quite of handy here because uh, what Hawkbit will do, it keeps uh, uh, or maintains an overview of your uh, the, the software state on your devices and has some management APIs to get, give you this information, also really handy management UI to um, that allow you to interact with the UI. Uh, it also has uh, connections to uh, artifact content delivery networks, uh, artifact content networks. It uh, has the capability to store your software somewhere. And this is one of the coolest features when you, if you ask me, it has the capability to do a rollout management. Because so far I've only talked about the uh, upper APIs, uh, the 
real magic is in the lower APIs because here you can each device can either directly some uh, federation service so to the device management federation API to get the information. Hey, there's a new update and please download it from this uh, location. Um, one thing which is not a drawback, but what you have to mention here is the device still needs to do or perform the update by itself. So the way Hawkwood is doing this, it has some something that they call distribution set. So when you do distribution set, you can combine a set of files that you need for your update or your firmware state. And then the device gets information, okay, up, download this um, distribution set and perform the update the way you normally perform updates. And this is really specific to the application, to the device. So it could be a new container, it could be the whole Linux subsystem, it could be just a package. So I guess you have more imagination than I do for what this could be. And what, so this, as I said, is specific to the device, but what Hawkwood is doing, it uh, keeps track of whether this was successful or not. So the device can signal, hey, this was, uh, this update worked and I'm now back up and running. And this allows Hawkwood to do some kind of campaign management. So for instance, you can say, I have a couple of devices, let's say 100 devices and I have an update and I'm really sure it works, but there's maybe a small option that it doesn't work. So I say, okay, maybe just roll it out to the first 10%. And once these 10% of the devices all work, let's do it to the other 90%. And with a click of a button, Hawkwood is doing that for you. To this point, I've mostly talked about software to managing the edge or even to model it or to support um, the data flow from and to the edge. But another really important aspect is actually the operating system on the device or on the edge device. And in many cases, this is uh, Linux. So that's why I also want to spend a couple of minutes on that topic. So when you develop uh, a, tra let's say, a traditional edge device or something uh, that's you it's more like an embedded device or somewhere in between this classical embedded device and the more um, computational powerful edge device. You end up in a situation that is depicted in this slide. So you have a embedded software project, which is tasked with finding the specific software for your specific product or specific device in this case. And you have a couple of layers that you have to fulfill here. First of all, you need your hardware and also the support for the hardware. So you need some drivers. Then you need the operating system. Um, and of course, then especially in this edge and cloud um, continuum and uh, architectures, you also need some add-on software and runtime services, um, which allow to the edge device to become part of the infrastructure. So in our case, it could be a client for Ditto, for instance, or a direct client for Hono, or it could also be the, the opportunity to execute containers, which is a really big topic also for the edge. So for instance, uh, with Ditto, you not only can control the actions and data coming from, from it to the edge to the IT sensors, but you could also, let's say, trigger the execution of software components like containers on the device or do some other more management, uh, infrastructure management uh, related topics, which is also in the field of runtime services in this case. Another thing which sometimes tends to be forgotten, but it's also really important to enable the other layers is of course tooling. So coming back to our embedded software projects, they, all, they need to find solutions for all these layers. And uh, luckily or happily, or it's a good thing, we have a lot of different projects and solutions out there. Um, most, many of them open source, maybe most, but also some proprietary solutions. And the task here is to pick the right one from each of these solutions and to align it in a, in a let's say in the right order um, with not only fulfilling technical requirements but also a lot of non-functional requirements as i would call them so for instance you want to keep track of um, the vulnerabilities so you need to make sure that you know which kind of software components are in your software stack you also need to know um, this for to fulfill the license obligations um, that's another thing also, when you put all these things together, you want to make sure that they really work well together on your, on your hardware. So you see there's a lot of things um, that are not part of the actual solution, but that you are either required to enable you. So um, this whole software stack, and we see potential for um, collaboration on this side. 
And that's where we see the potential for a missing link, um, which is something that uh, as the working title could be referred to as industrial great Linux. So it's not uh, a simple Linux distribution. It's uh, many good, really good ones out there already. It's more about the idea to find some certain elements in the upstream project world um, in these different layers that I just mentioned before to um, be really aligned um, so that we have a uh, working software stack, which could also be um, provided by the um, provider or service uh, provider or distributor in a form like a kind of IGL Pro. Um, and, but this again is not just about technology, but also about these other aspects. For instance, a really big topic could be the shared testing to um, work together on this setting up and deciding on the testing infrastructure and uh, for different devices and different device uh, classes. And with that, um, if you are more interested in the more details on this side, we have a whole talk uh, during this conference, which is uh, a case study and in, uh, on the use of Linux or in heterogeneous industrial devices. And if you're interested in that, I really recommend maybe watching the recording of this um, at some point. Where are we or from here? So how do we put all these things together so that we end up in a situation that you can see in the picture where all our docs or our devices and our analogy are working well behaved together in the same direction to, uh, to the same common goal, the way we want it. So let's go back to the challenges that we had. So if you're looking at our picture and also the challenges, I think listening to the talk, you, we can, can come to the conclusion that for the connectivity, one option is to set, go for Eclipse Hono and then connect this with Eclipse Ditto to maintain a good overview of the device state to not always need to directly talk, to, to not always have the need to directly talk to your device, but still be able to manage this from the cloud in the cloud. Once we have this whole data pipeline, it's not a real pipeline, but, um, your infrastructure set up. Um, we also might be interested in modeling that or uh, representing the device data and capabilities. And based on the question whether you want more the model device focused or mid more digital twin focused, you can go for Eclipse Porto or the OMP bar meta model. And you also want to manage the firmware on your devices, and for that you can go with Eclipse Hawkbit. And with that, I want to leave it with that and uh, want to open the floor for questions and want to thank you for joining my session. And in case you have any questions, comments, uh, other ideas, um, feel free to contact me maybe on GitHub, get handle with Eric Sven, or you can also see my email here. So with that, with that let's see if you have any questions or comments, or otherwise we can close the session. Thank you.